combination is unknown. So Spirov says there's no doubt that estrogen and breast cancer are related. And if we, and he says there's multiple factors. So we need to figure out how do we identify these factors. So whether it is the, imp the important factor is the total amount of estrogen. And if you're looking at the total amount of estrogen, you can look at the blood. Right? But we know that the total amount of estrogen is not important. It's the free amount of estrogen that's important. Or is it the amount of estrogen unopposed by progesterone? Because we know that progesterone will counteract the effects of, of estrogen, not only in the uterus, but in the breast. And that, that's coming up in just a minute. Is it the amount of free unbound estradiol? What's the, where's the best place to look for free unbound estradiol? Where's the best place to look for free unbound estradiol? Saliva. Okay, I'm trying to see if y'all were listening. Okay, yes. All right. Or the duration of exposure to estrogen, and that's controlled by how fast is it excreted from the cell and how fast it is metabolized. Because if, it's, if metabolism is slow, then it's going to, the duration of exposure is going to be increased. Or some other combination is unknown. But at least we understand these different areas. We know that progesterone is important. We know how to uh, measure the unbound portion. We know that metabolism is important, and we're going to talk about metabolism after lunch, hormone metabolism, and that's why hormones affect different people differently. All right? On page 599, uh, Spiroff also states that evidence indicates that, that with increasing duration of exposure, progesterone can limit breast epithelial growth as it does with endometrial epithelium. Again, Progesterone will have its characteristic effect no matter where it goes, all right? So just like progesterone works for endometrial epithelium by slowing down growth and uh, suppressing oncogenes and excreting estrogen from the cell, it does the same thing in the breast, right? There was a study done that says human breast tissue specimens removed after patients were treated with estradiol and progesterone indicates that progesterone inhibits the in vivo estradiol-induced proliferation. What they did was there's a study done, and it was infertility and sterility. They had patients who were going in for a breast biopsy. And what they did is that two weeks before, a group of patients just, released, just received estradiol on the breast, transdermally. One group received estrogen and progesterone, and the other group received just progesterone only on their breast tissue. Okay. Then they did the biopsy, and they did two things. They looked at the blood level of estrogen and progesterone, and in all three of them, they were unchanged. Then they looked at the tissue level of estrogen and progesterone, and they looked at the mitotic activity of those tissues. So they had the group with estrogen only. Their tissue level of estrogen was like four, five, six times what was in the blood and the mitotic index was like triple, so they, the, the uh, breast cells were proliferating at a higher rate. They looked at the ones with estrogen and progesterone, both of the tissue levels were elevated, but the mitotic activity was the same, it, was, it, it hadn't changed. And then they, did the, they took at the ones with the progesterone, their progesterone tissue levels were elevated, and the mitotic activity was actually decreased by two times. So this is the test, this is the study that they were talking about where they said estrogen inhibits in vivo estradiol-induced proliferation. Because when they gave the estrogen and progesterone together, there was no change in the mitotic activity in those breast cancer cells that they had uh, taken out through um, <coughs> with a biopsy from uh, in, in a surgical biopsy. So progesterone protects the breast just like it does in the endometrial epithelium. So the question that you asked was why does your doctor keep saying you don't need progesterone if you don't have a uterus? And that is caterpillar thinking. Because that's what we were told. Okay? If you don't have a uterus, most women still have breasts. So if they still have breasts, you have to protect that breast epithelial tissue from estrogen, which we know causes proliferation. Okay? The reason why we thought that if you don't have a uterus, you don't need progesterone, because progestins were created to prevent endometrial cancer. 
okay? But that is why progesterone, if you don't have a uterus, you don't need progestins. But you do need progesterone. And because ACOG and NAMS tries to say that progestins and progesterone are the same, we have started saying this, and we've been saying it. That I told you, when I said gynecology made simple, what were the two questions we asked? How old are you? And the other question we need to ask is, do you have a uterus? And those are the only two things you needed to know to treat a patient, is how old are you and do you have a uterus? But that doesn't make sense. That's caterpillar thinking. Now, not only... Mm -hmm. breast cancer because, uh, I, I talk about that with, uh, uh, when I talk about breast cancer and inflammation, because Provera increases something called uh, matrix metalloproteinase. Provera disrupts, it, 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 uh, when you say matrix metalloproteinase, it disrupts the surrounding tissue. I, at the end of the day, I'm going to talk about breast cancer and inflammation. If you have a breast cancer cell, and you disrupt the tissue surrounding that cancer cell, it gives the cancer cell more opportunity to spread. So because the Provera disrupted the tissue, it causes the breakdown of the matrix of normal tissue, it, it allowed free access of the breast cancer so to, to, to proliferate. So yes, adding Provera actually increased the risk of breast cancer because it's not progesterone. It did what you wanted it to do in the endometrium, but it disrupted the tissue of the breast. Okay, so yeah, you're right. Provera is the, is the bad actor in that, in causing breast. It enhances. Also what Provera does, it decreases sex hormone binding globulin. So now there's more free estrogen there, so it's increasing the estrogen proliferation, and also it's disrupting the tissue around the breast cancer cell, so it's easier for it to break through. Okay. Progesterone does not, yes, progesterone does not do that. Yeah, it, 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 it well, that, that may be part of it. it. It's probably a lot of factors that we, you know, that we don't know, but I know that's one. It increases matrix metalloproteinase, it lowers sex hormone binding globulin, and you're right, if you're taking it every day and it lasts for 30 days, it's probably you know, saturating that tissue and causes, uh, causing the excess. But you're right, yeah, the, the <coughs> Primpro arm was worse. But you can't extrapolate that out to progesterone. But that, yeah, 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 I know, I know. No, no, I'm just saying that. But, but, you, but you know, the reason why is, the reason why is that the leaders that we, are supposed to be following the lead caterpillars, they confuse you like that. They, they use these words interchangeably, but they're not. They say progestins or progestogens, but you cannot put that whole group together. Each one of them, you know, I, I used to, I, I would talk about, I don't hear them anymore, but the birth control guys would come in and they would tell you how their progestin is different. Okay, so, and how would they make it different? They would, they would change the structure of it. So if they all are different and they would tell you, well, this has less uh, diuretic uh, you know, activity, or this has, you know, this doesn't cause as much edema, this doesn't cause as much depression, because they changed it, and so you get a different effect. So if you change that structure, you're going to get different positives and different negatives. But if you use what physiology says, hey, I'm making this in order for estradiol to not get out of hand in the breast and the uterus, also, you have progesterone receptors in the brain. Progesterone binds the GABA, not progesterone, but one of the metabolites, binds the GABA receptor of the brain. That's why progesterone is common. You have progesterone receptors in the smooth muscles that surround the vascular system. You have progesterone receptors in the kidney. It blocks aldosterone, so it becomes a, a diuretic. So I tell it that the only way you don't need progesterone if you don't have a uterus is that at the time of the hysterectomy, you remove the patient's breast, you take out their circulatory system, you take out their central nervous system and their brain, you take out their kidneys, 
Now, once you do that, then they won't need progesterone again. But as long as they have all of those other systems, it, they're, they're progesterone receptors in all of those systems. Okay, so again, you know, we practice this gynecology made simple, and really it is to make us feel comfortable with using the drugs that the drug manufacturers are making. So we make up our own physiology based on what the drug rep comes in and says. And then the North American Menopause Society and ACOG are influenced by them. And again, we get so confused that we just keep doing what is comfortable. Because it's not comfortable, it's not easy to not prescribe birth control pills to a 15 year old. You know, and it's not easy to tell a person to get off a of primer. And it, you know, it's just not, so let, let me move on. All right, <clears throat> now, what the drug reps used to say is that, why are you worrying about breast cancer when most women die of heart disease? That was a line they used to come in and say. Now, this is breast cancer, these squares right here, and the diamonds are heart disease, okay? Now, between age 30 and 50, what do most women die of? The squares are the diamonds the squares, which are breast cancer, okay? Now, remember that 15-year-old girl that I put on birth control pills? And she stayed on them till 25 or 30, let's say she stayed on them till 30. So now, she's also at increased risk for another one to four years. So I just increased her risk of breast cancer from here to here, and she's there for another three or four years, okay? And the reason why most women die during this time between 30 and 50, because this is deaths from breast cancer, not just incidents, is because between age 30 and 50, especially between age 35 and 50, they're more likely to have anovulatory cycles. Because, you know, after age 35, the ovaries are, we get to the bottom of the barrel of the egg basket or the ovaries. So you're going to get more irregular bleeding, you're going to get more anovulatory cycles. So as you can see that as the age goes up, their breast cancer, their risk of breast cancer goes up even more because these patients are more exposed to estrogen. So to think that it's not important what we're doing and how, what we're prescribing around this age is, 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 is not necessarily good medicine. <clears throat> now, the other thing that we're taught is that patients should get these mammograms in order for early breast cancer detection. But the problem with mammograms is that usually the breast cancer has been around for about six to seven, six or seven years before we ever see it in mammogram. Now, what you would like to do and what I propose is that back here in the 30s or 40s when, you know, when they're starting to get any signs of hormone imbalance, that if we could change the environment, if we should, could make sure that they had enough progesterone, that their estrogen was not too high, that we could slow down this progression, or sometimes you could even stop the progression, progression if you balanced their hormones and you made sure that they had enough progesterone to protect their, uh, their uh, breast endo uh, endothelium, if you made sure there wasn't enough, uh, that, that there wasn't too much estrogen. So if you could change the environment, maybe you could slow down this growth of a cancer cell so that you can do things before their uh, is anything on a mammogram. I, I, I would say that the endpoints that we usually use are do we see something on mammogram or do they have postmenopausal bleeding? But we don't want to have an environment that encourages this. We want to be able to change it back here and so that we don't have to use this as an endpoint. <clears throat> and we use mammograms to try and uh, diagnose breast cancers. But about 19% of all breast cancers occur in, age, in women age 40 to 49 than in women 50 to 59, accounting for approximately 20% of all deaths from breast cancer. So most of the breast cancers are happening in women age 40 to 49. But tumors grow faster in younger women and accurate mammograms are more difficult due to dense breast tissue in younger women. So the problem is, is that what we're using to diagnose breast cancer is not very effective in the women who are most likely to die from breast cancer. So just to say that, hey, I'm doing mammograms every year, and I'll show you a study, I think it's, I think it's the next thing that I'm showing. Yeah, new advice, skip mammograms in the 40s. You guys remember when this came out, I don't have the year, but this was like two or three years ago. 
They said, yeah, it may have been last year. They were saying, why, should, why are we doing so? Most women don't need mammograms in their 40s and should get one every two years starting at age 50. A government task force said Monday, it's a major reversal that conflicts with the American Cancer Society long-standing position, and it's, it's an opinion. Okay? Also, the task force, for most women of the past two decades, the Cancer Society has been recommending annual mammograms beginning at age 40. The reason why, okay, it says, the benefits are less and harms are greater than screening starts in, uh, when screening starts in the 40s. All right, one, 2009, I thought it was several years ago. So this came out and came a, became a big uh, uproar. Now, this is in 2005. It's saying that women, most women die between age 40 and 49, and that mammograms are not very accurate due to the breast tissue being more dense. Here's the, remember I told you how the, the Provera disrupts the, the tissue around the breast cancer, that matrix metalloproteinase? Well, mammograms do what to the tissue, to the breast? They squeeze it, damaging tissue, and it's radiating the tissue. Is that making the tissue more healthy or less healthy? <laughs> but yeah and the more often you have a mammogram between age 40 and 50 your breast cancer risk goes up and 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 that's why in the study said the benefits are less and the harms are greater so what harms are they talking about they're talking about damaging tissue over and over and over again so if you damage the tissue around it, and again, when I talk about inflammation and breast cancer, when you damage the tissue, it allows cancer cells easier access to begin to spread. The healthier the tissue around the cancer, I don't want to give away that lecture, but if you do aut autopsies on patients, you'll see breast cancer clusters of, of cancer in the prostate and the breast, but it's contained. Well, the reason why is that the tissue around it is, is healthy. So it doesn't matter that you have a cancer cell, it's how easily the, is that cancer cell allowed to, to spread. And the more damage the tissue is around it, the more likely it is to, to damage. So, you know, nobody talks about there's harms in mammograms. You, you know, like harms, how could a mammogram be harmful? But that's what this study is saying, that hey, repeated mammograms can be harmful. You don't want to start them too early, and you especially don't want to damage tissue during this time where breast cancers are more lethal. So that's why they said start at 50 and not at 40, because that's at the height of fatalities of breast cancer. But here's what happened. This study came out based on evidence, and this is, uh, who did this? This is the, uh, uh, the task force. This is a government task force. So they weren't funded by any pharmaceutical company. The evidence comes out, but there's a lot of money invested in mammogram machines, and the radiologists make a lot of money off of reading these mammograms. So the radiologists and the mammogram, the radiology society, they went crazy when this came out, and now you don't hear about it anymore. You haven't heard about it since, I, since it came out in 2009. Because when evidence goes against financial interest, financial interest usually went out. Yeah, so they're trying to get close to this. But, the, but that's the American Cancer Society. But the radiologists are going to tell you that you need to do it every year because that hurts their pocketbook if people don't do it for 40 to 50. Okay, then new breast cancer imaging methods that are being marked as problem-solving adjunctive tools and second-look devices carry much higher radiation risk than mam mammography, a new study includes. Concludes. I think they kind of got rid of this. So they tried to, to, uh, to have an alternative, but it delivered more radiation, so it damaged tissue even more, and uh, it, they think it caused even more harm. All right? So if you want to try and affect breast cancer, you want to try and have an environment that does not promote breast cancer. So what you need to do is we need to look at how much progesterone, how much free estradiol, and we try and balance that so that we can get the ultimate biologic response in the breast, and in the uterus and in the brain and in every other tissue that has estrogen or progesterone receptors. All right, perimenopause. 
The menstrual cycle change prior to menopause is marked by elevated FSH levels and decreased levels of inhibit, but normal levels of LH and slightly elevated levels of estradiol. We were taught that if FSH is elevated, then that meant that the person was estrogen deficient. Is that not right? That how we, taught, how we knew that somebody was in menopause is that we looked at their FSH, and if FSH was elevated, then that means they weren't making estrogen. Okay, that's what we were taught. But in perimenopause on page 629, it says the menstrual cycle change prior to menopause, what we call perimenopause, is marked by what? Elevated FSH and decreased levels of inhibit, but normal levels of LH and slightly elevated levels of estradiol. So now we have elevated FSH and elevated estradiol in perimenopause. So that goes against what we were taught. Ah, I'm glad you asked. I, I, you couldn't have been, you couldn't have been uh, a time better. What is inhibin? Inhibin is made by the dominant follicle. Okay, remember we had a primary follicle and then you had a dominant follicle. The dominant follicle makes inhibin to inhibit further release of FSH so that you don't have quadruplets and you don't become octamom. Okay, so that's why we have single and, you know, me, you know single uh, babies or twins, we very seldom have litters. Because once a dominant follicle is determined that this is the one that's going to ovulate, it makes inhibin so that your pituitary will stop make F, making FSH and stop stimulating more follicles. Okay? So in perimenopause, here's what happens. You ha the, the, the amount of follicles that you have in the ovary, they are the same amount that you had when you were born. Actually, 20 weeks before you're ever born, all of the follicles that you're going to ever have are in your ovary. Okay? You don't make any new follicles. You don't make any new eggs. All right? Now, when you get to perimenopause, what happens is you begin to scrape the bottom of the barrel of the egg basket. Now you've got 35 and 40 year old eggs that FSH, that your pituitary is trying to stimulate to become a dominant follicle. All right? Now, here's how I kind of look at it. You've got a 38 year old egg. The pituitary is saying, I need you to ovulate. The egg is saying, I've been here for 38 years. All my friends have already ovulated. You've passed me by. Okay, I'll give, it a, I'll give it a try, but I don't know if I can do it. Okay, now, the whole time that FSH is trying to get that follicle to, to ovulate, what is it making? It's making estrogen. Remember, the, the, that, that primary follicle is making some estrogen trying to become a dominant follicle. Well, it may not make it all the way to ovulation, so it doesn't make inhibit. So FSH says, okay, let me try another egg, uh, another follicle. So it may have to go to 15 different follicles to try and get one of those guys to ovulate. Now, so it has to have a lot of FSH to try and stimulate those follicles, so FSH goes up. You've got all of these follicles going through the proliferative phase, not ovulating, and so that FSH in those follicles are making what? Elevated levels of estradiol. And because you don't have dominant follicles, that you see decreased levels of inhibit. Okay, so inhibit is down. FSH is up because it can't get one of these suckers to, to ovulate. So that's what happens in perimenopause. You get high levels of estradiol. The FSH is trying to get a follicle to ovulate. And that dominant follicle is not there, so you're not getting a whole lot of inhibit. Now, I'm going to tell you, I didn't understand that until I had been practicing for 16, 17 years and start. I didn't know all that. FSH high, estrogen is low. So what happens when a perimenopausal woman comes in, they're having bleeding, and we get a high FSH? We give them more estrogen. 
We give them more estrogen, what gets worse? The fibroids grow worse, the bleeding is worse. So now that our treatment didn't work, now what do we do? You take out the, <laughs> you take out the uterus. Exactly. And what we'll say is that they have a bad uterus. It's not responding like I thought it should respond. They don't have a bad uterus. We have a bad understanding what FSH means in perimenopause. Right? In the average woman, accelerated follicular depletion and declining fertility begins at age 37, 30, uh, 37 to 38. Menopause follows 13 years later. So you start scraping the bottom of the barrel of the egg basket about 37, 38. That's when all these women come in with bipolar, you know, bipolar diagnosis, they have fibroids. It all happens right around here because we're starting to get imbalances of too much estradiol and no ovulation, so their progesterone is going down. So that's usually when these women start to come in complaining of hormonal problems. So you ask me what is inhibit. This is on page 629. It says, FSH measurement is a clinical assessment of inhibin. FSH goes up when inhibin goes down. Okay, it's right there on 629. We're OBGYNs. I never ever saw this until I tried to figure out how to explain what I was <laughs> trying to, to teach. Okay, there's an inverse and tight relationship between FSH and inhibin in the case that inhibin is a sensitive marker of ovarian follicular competence and in turn FSH measurement is a clinical assessment of inhibin. The decrease in inhibin secretion by the ovaries, by the ovarian follicles begins early around age 35. And it says, I always say, furthermore the ineffective ability to suppress gonadotropins with postmenopausal hormone therapy is a consequence of loss of inhibin. For this reason, FSH cannot be used clinically to tighter estrogen dosage in postmenopausal hormone therapy. Because you would think that if we're using FSH to determine who is low in estrogen, we should be able to give them estrogen and then follow the FSH to see if it's back to normal. But because FSH has nothing really to do with estrogen, it has more to do with inhibin, you can't use it to follow and to tighter estrogen dosage. But we weren't taught that. You didn't know what inhibin was? I'm gonna tell you, I didn't understand what inhibin was because I had been taught caterpillar thinking, high FSH means low estrogen, give them Primer. Ask them, do you have a uterus? You don't have a uterus, you don't need Provera. You don't need progesterone, you don't need Provera. It's very simplistic. But you know, this is my problem. We went to school and tried to make the highest grades possible. We studied like crazy for the MCAT. We studied for the state boards. And then we get brought down to this simplistic thinking as a clinician. High FSH, give Provera. Do this, do that, do this, do that. See this, do that, see this, do that. And we accept it because it's comfortable. And I'm gonna tell you, this is a lot more interesting to understand what is going on because if you understand the basic physiology, you can almost think your way through any problem. Just like when I was talking about birth control pills, you start you started remembering, oh yeah, the receptors and then you know, undifferentiated growth. And you understand the basics and you can start thinking your way through anything. And that's why I'm saying, I'm not gonna give you a bunch of protocols. I'll tell you, a lot of people are teaching. I'm gonna teach you the newest protocol in hormone replacement therapy. You've seen those ads? And they say, oh, we got 20 different new protocols. You don't need a protocol. I'm not gonna give you any protocol. But if we learn the basic physiology that FSH has nothing to do with, it, it has nothing to do with estrogen, it's associated with inhibin, that progesterone and progestin, you don't need a protocol. You think your way through it. You get good information by not looking in the corner where the light is and going to where the hormone actually is. You can think your way through anything. And I, I see it all the time and it infuriates me to say, oh, if they complain of this or that, you use this protocol. They complain of this or that, you use this protocol. You use this protocol. No. You, you think your way through it. You go and you get good information, clinically useful information. And then you base your treatment on that. 
and then you go back and retest and make sure that's what you would do with blood pressure if the blood pressure was high and you gave an antihypertensive you would retake the blood pressures to see if your therapy had worked you wouldn't ask them do you have a headache are your eyes bulging out you know do you, do you feel like you're about to have a stroke no you would take the blood pressure because you don't want them to get to the point where they have a stroke you don't want them to get to the point where they have positive mammogram or they have endometrial cancer. All right, so let me, let me calm down. All right, throughout the perimenopausal period, there's significant evidence of dysfunctional uterine bleeding. Although the greatest concern provoked by this, this symptom is endometrial neoplasia, the usual finding is non-neoplastic tissue displaying estrogen effects unopposed by estrogen. So this is what you're seeing in the perimenopause, unopposed estrogen by progesterone because they're not ovulating in this perimenopausal period. There are four mechanisms that could result in increased endogenous estrogen levels. Incur increased precursor androgens, okay? <clears throat> like androgen, like uh, androgen down to testosterone. Functional and non-functional endocrine tumors. Usually that's, you don't see a lot of tumors. Liver disease are stress, because stress can cause increase in androgens, uh, especially testosterone. Increased aromatization, because they have extra, or, or they're obese because they have increased aromat uh, uh, aromatase in the fat tissue, hypothyroidism and liver disease. Increased direct secretion of estrogen. This is usually, you don't know, see a whole lot of ovarian tumors. But decreased levels of sex hormone binding globulin leading to increased levels of free estrogen. And we talked about all of the things that can decrease sex hormone bi binding globulin, weight, uh, uh, steroids, low fiber, uh, low thyroid function. This is what you'll see. The two things that you see most of all is decreased sex hormone binding globulin and increased aromatization because most women are going to start to gain weight around their 35 and 40s, primarily due to unopposed estrogen causing a suppression of thyroid function and therefore these women gain weight. So this is a 42 year old with fibroids, menorrhagia and PMS. You can see that her estradiol level is elevated even though she is not taking any estrogen. And her progesterone level, even though it's in the normal range, it's not in balance. So if you have high estrogen and you have normal progesterone, then the progesterone estrogen ratio is actually low. I told you you can balance people either at high levels or at low levels, but you can't have this. All right, so now, patient comes in, with fibroids, menorrhagia, and PMS. You do a salivary test, and you see this. The estrogen-progesterone ratio is low. If you did a blood test, more than 